So I'm going to talk in the perspective of a creativity researcher and talk about things that are both believed correctly and believed less correctly by the general public and to a degree um, by some, but not all, neuroscientists. So an awful lot of layperson ideas about creativity, so you have to be divinely inspired, or creative means being shockingly different, pure originality verging on chaos, creative people are weird or crazy. This is not true. <laughs> You were born creative, which, you, you know, at one point you would address. Only, only geniuses are creative. Creativity comes in isolation, so you have to bar yourself up and be alone and meditate, um, not at a regular level, but purely alone, um, in order to be creative. And then you have things like creativity is a soft construct. Nobody agrees in a definition. Isn't measuring creativity putting a box outside of the box? And indeed, uh, if you are a creativity researcher, what you find, for example, is that when you apply for grants, they can't actually be about creativity. They have to be about something else, and then you slip in the creativity when nobody's looking. Um, for one call for grants, I was on the phone with this many from NSF, and it actually specified, like, we're looking for creativity stuff, and then on the phone, she's like, yeah, but you probably don't want to use the word creativity. <laughs> Maybe something more like cognition. <laughs> so some of this is absolute BS. So the idea that creativity can't be, can't be defined is nonsense. We've basically agreed on a core definition for about 40 to 50 years that something is creative if it is both new but also task appropriate. So if I ask you to pave my driveway and you pave it with day-old salami, that's not creative. It is new, it is different, but it is not functional. If you build a bridge that is the most beautiful bridge of all time and it collapses, that's not a creative bridge. It's a beautiful bridge, an aesthetic bridge. It wouldn't be called creative because it is not fulfilling the task demands. Other people suggest maybe there's an element of high quality there. Not always. Other people suggest an element of surprise, that something creative should be surprising in a way. These are less agreed upon. But then other things that people believe there's kind of some truth in, as much as we don't like to admit it. And one of that is about creativity measurement. And the fact is creativity is hard to measure well. That we have many measures, and we have a lot of evidence showing that they kind of, sort of, sometimes work occasionally, to a degree. <laughs> the two most common measures that people use are divergent thinking tests and what's called the remote association tests. So divergent thinking tests often start by asking very open-ended questions. You know, what would happen if people had five arms? How many uses can you think of for this clicker? How would you improve this setup? How many changes would you make to make it better? Or they sometimes do it more figuratively, where they give you a row of shapes or lines, and they ask you to turn them into something else. So maybe you would turn one box into a house, maybe you turn another box into a window, et cetera. And then they score it primarily on three different areas. One is the idea of fluency. And this is how many ideas do you have? They have to be somewhat relevant, but there is a very large discrepancy in how it's scored, whether you do an official one I'm worried I'm just drinking random waters. Oh, well. Sorry. Um, but, and this is one reason why divergent thinking or comparable tests are typically not used for any real high-level stakes thing, you can train them. You can teach people how to do better at this. And fluency is the easiest one. 
come up with as many different ideas as you possibly can, and this is something you get better at if you practice. This is one reason why I left working in educational testing service. Then there's flexibility, which is how many categories your ideas match. So for example, if I'm asking, what would you do with this? You know, you could say, you could use it to advance a presentation for a talk. You could use it to advance a presentation for a informal presentation. You could use it to advance a PowerPoint when you're talking to a group of friends. These are all different ideas, but they're kind of the same thing. If you say that you could use a pencil to write a novel, write a poem, write a play, and keep going with that for five minutes, you would get an incredibly high fluency score, but a very low flexibility score. This is also by far the biggest pain in the ass to score out of the three of them. <laughs> the other one, which is the closest to what we think of about creativity, is originality. And this tends to be measured by simply looking at how unusual or unique are your ideas. So the way they do that is they compare your responses with other people's responses. So if I were to ask all of you for, you know, how could you use a brick, for example, and you all spend five minutes writing them all down, what I would do is I would collect all the responses, make a big list, and so this response was said by 100, I have no idea how many, I'm not good at asking many people, by 20 people. This response was said by 18 people, all the way down to responses that were said by one person. And if you're the only person to say it, you get a certain number of points. If one of the persons said it, a certain number of points. This does measure something, but there are also some major problems with that. For example, if you're doing anything that is more practical oriented, so for example, we use a divergent thinking type task rooted in engineering. One of the problems is that the, by far the best solutions are the most straightforward ones. So if you ask 700 engineers, and we did, to think of all these different possible ideas for how you could use less heat in your house. The five answers that actually work are the ones everybody comes up with. The other ones tend to be just less good answers. So yes, you could say you could use peanut butter to you know, coat your house, and that's very clever, and you could argue it's relevant, but nobody ever actually do that. So, the originality component is both the most important and also particularly flawed. The other major instrument that is often used, particularly in, in neuroscience um, and business research, is the RAT, or the Remote Associates Test. This is based on a theory that argues that you think of a central concept. So cow, and then you think everything comes to mind with cow, you know, grass, cud, beef, milk, cheese, goats, cheddar, and he keeps going more and more extended. So each connection links to a new one. And so some people will just think when they hear cow of the immediate milk, cheese, farm, and others will be thinking to more, uh, well, remote associations. So for example, you know, Bart Simpson and Via don't have a cow. That is a more remote association. Less people would perhaps think of Bart Simpson for cow than milk, or a particular type of cow. I have not done my cow research. They've developed a test based on this, which is kind of interesting and is kind of fun to play. They give you three words, in this case, sleeping, bean, and trash. And the idea is that you have these maps in your head for sleeping and bean and trash, and there is a word that intersects all three of these. So a word that goes with sleeping, a word that goes with bean, and a word that goes with trash. <laughs> Sleeping bag, bean bag, trash bag. A couple of problems with this. The biggest one being, is this actually creativity? Or is it basically just another measure of intelligence? 
because it involves vocabulary, it involves all these cognitive processes, and it's convergent. It is not exploring new, it is can you use this information to answer, in essence, a question that has a right or a wrong answer. And whenever I do these with my class, there's always a couple of people who will come up with a really great wrong answer. And one that actually makes sense, that the connections are a little more unusual, and the problem is that these are the people who are, are wrong. So there are many advantages to these tests. I mean, they are quick to give, they are quick to score, they tend to be cheap or free, and you know, it takes five minutes to give. It takes, depends how many people, but not much longer to score. But how do we get over some of the very basic problems that, that we have with that? So including everything I've mentioned, but also the fact these are very artificial tasks. Um, and since, in addition, these are very generalist tasks. So it is looking at kind of creative thought, but then you wonder, okay, would a really creative dancer be particularly good at this? I mean, maybe, but certainly not capturing anything what you were talking about with what it means to be a dancer at all. It's, or virtually anything other than people who like playing with words or doodling. So the one that I love is the consensual assessment, consensual assessment technique, also known as the cat. And yes, that means there is a cat and a rat. Uh, and what you do is that you have people actually do something creative. And this can range from poems to math equations, art, ad campaigns, stories, science experiments, all, everything you can almost imagine. And what then happens is you bring in expert or quasi-expert raters, and we found that graduate, graduate students work pretty well, actually. Um, or bright undergrads, if there are some knowledge in the field. Um, teachers of the subject, depending on what, what level you're looking at. So this, and what we found, and many people have found, is that people agree at a bizarrely high rate about what is the more creative stuff and the less creative stuff. And it's totally counterintuitive when you think about, you know, people debating or arguing about what is more or less creative. I mean, even if you think about movies, people tend, you would not imagine people would agree on movies, and yet, if you even just look at all the ratings on IMDb, they agree at a bizarrely high rate. And what this allows is actual creative production. Even something like dance, it can be done live and have the raters there reading the performance. Um, there are, you know, so there are things that are harder to do than others, and it's something where I think we're two to five years away from being able to really do this decently online for at least half of these domains, which will make it much easier. But the problem is it's, it takes longer. It takes a lot more effort. Sometimes it takes money. Um, people don't really like doing this. You know, I mean, one of the first studies I did with this, we had 200 poems, 200 personal narratives, and 200 <coughs> stories written by eighth graders. And we brought in a panel of 13 experts. And they agreed on what was created, and they also agreed they really hated doing this, <laughs> that it was painful, that they just, you know, then we paid them, and they still complained to us a lot. <laughs> and unfortunately, novices, pure novices, tend not to agree. So when you force your undergraduate students to do this, um, which would have been ideal if they did agree because undergraduate labor is, you know, among the best kinds of labor. <laughs> it's a lot, it's, it's mostly scattered. Graduate students, yes. Like seniors who are undergrads and who are, you know, a major in the topic, kind of, sort of. But kind of random undergrads who are taking one psych class and have no interest in poetry whatsoever, they will A, give you bad teaching evaluations, and B, not agree with either themselves or experts. Most of neuroscience, with some notable exceptions, 
tend to use divergent thinking or the rat. And there are many very valid reasons why they want to use this because it costs money to, you know, just time in the machine and all this stuff, and the cat takes longer. Um, and this is just one of several ways that it goes beyond measurement. So just as another example, one theory of creativity is the 4C theory, which argues that there's different levels of creative trajectory and development, where mini C is the act of creativity that happens when you learn how to do something or the process of something. So, you know, if you are trying to learn, um, let's say, a mathematical concept, you make your own metaphors in your mind. You, just in trying to understand it, you have this personally meaningful to you creative act. It may be that you're coming to the same conclusions that people have come to for years and that nobody else would think it's creative, but it is creative to you. And with feedback, you can get to the point of what's called little c or everyday creativity where what you do would be considered creative by other people. So people would choose to listen or watch or study or analyze whatever it is that you put out to the world. With practice comes pro C, expert level creativity, the kind where you, you know, you've put in the number of hours to be an expert and you are a professional blank and people will pay money and actually ardently, actively <laughs> seek out your work. And then big C, or creative genius, it's kind of, that happens with history. So usually that's called, are you considered creative after you die? So it <laughs> tends to you know, be less personally meaningful because it happens after you're dead. And do, basically, does history remember you? Does what you do last generations? And we can't always predict. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. The, if you look at people who won the Pulitzer Prize in the 1900s and 1910s, some of the names are legendary, and some literally nobody in this entire room would have ever heard of. So we can tell who's pro C in their lifetime. Big C's a lot harder. Most neuroscience studies, like most studies, period, tend to be done on undergraduates because they're there. So we're talking mini or little c, which is great, but doesn't necessarily reveal a whole lot about the upper echelons. And these are just two snippets of how the idea of how we conceptualize creativity tends to be kind of these slices. Um, that was kind of a cute double meaning word. Um, that is captured, and it's not just neuroscience which does this, but the more that neuroscience can tap into what's basically been almost 70 years of research on creativity, stuff that we know about creativity, and to not ignore that. Most fields, I mean, engineering does this all, all the time, tend to reinvent the wheel. They tend to not particularly want to seek out what's been done, but to redefine it for their domain. And you end up with a lot of papers being published that you know, the authors fully believe is a completely new idea, when in fact people in creativity have been talking about this stuff for 40 years. Um, and just the same way that most folks in creativity research wouldn't know a brain if it smacked them in the head. Um, feels very Monty Python-esque, actually. Um, and so th this type of communication, collaboration, cross-discipline stuff is one of the ways to move past this. Thank you very much.